1939, as the Second World War was just beginning, a German pastor and theologian named Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he published a little book called Life Together. It was a book that he'd written on the basis of his experience in this small seminary community he founded, which was in opposition to Nazi influence in the German church. And it was a book that would go on to become something of a modern spiritual classic. If you've never had the opportunity to read it before, I, I'd encourage you to do so. And I have no doubt that Richard Foster would as well, because it's a book that he quotes from on numerous occasions, most especially in his chapter on the discipline of confession. Uh, the reason I mention it, though, is not just to make a recommendation for you. It's because of something Bonhoeffer says in that chapter, something about the practice of confessing your sins and just how difficult that is. Confession, he says, in the presence of another believer is the most profound kind of humiliation. It hurts, makes one feel small. It deals a terrible blow to one's pride. To stand before another Christian as a sinner is an almost unbearable disgrace. I think that's an important place to begin if we're going to talk about the practice of confession. It's important to start off by saying that it isn't easy, quite the opposite. It hurts, as Bonhoeffer says. It can make you feel small and ashamed. It is, quite frankly, humiliating. And yet, as Richard Foster notes in the first part of his discussion of this discipline, confession is something the New Testament instructs and expects of every Christian. Jesus taught his disciples to confess their sins when he taught them how to pray. The Apostle John says that if anyone sins, he or she should confess their sins and be confident that God will forgive them of their sin. Uh, likewise, the Apostle James says, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Richard Foster has much to say on this topic, and his chapter is worth reading and rereading. But for the sake of this brief video, I'd like to focus on two questions I think his chapter helps us to answer. First, why should we confess our sins? And second, how? How should we confess our sins? So first, why should we confess our sins? It's fair enough to say, as I did just a moment ago, that the Bible instructs us to regularly confess our sins. But why is that? What is the actual purpose of confession? Uh, Richard Foster, he gives several different answers to this question. The first of which involves a clarification on what confession is not. Confession, he says, is not just some kind of therapy. It isn't something we do just so we can feel better or rid ourselves of unwanted feelings of guilt or regret. Without the cross, he says, the discipline of confession would be only psychologically therapeutic. But it is so much more. It involves a change in our relationship with God and a subjective change in us. It is a means of healing and transforming the inner spirit. The book of Hebrews tells us that when we come before God's throne, seeking mercy and forgiveness, we can come with confidence because, and this is something Foster emphasizes very strongly, because Jesus is our perfect high priest who has taken our sin upon himself and made forgiveness available to us, no matter what we do. So we're not just confessing to feel better. The discipline of confession is our way of receiving this gift of what Christ has done for us on the cross. Along with that, Foster says that confession is important because it strengthens our relationships with one another. Again, this is something that Dietrich Bonhoeffer also talks about. Bonhoeffer said that in confession, there takes place a breakthrough to community. Now, you might ask, well, why would that be? Why does conf the confession of sin enable or somehow encourage community? Because the nature of sin is to alienate us. Sin is 
wants to remain unknown and secret. Just think about Adam and Eve in the garden and how in their shame, they hide away from God. They alienate themselves. And that's how sin operates. It, it puts up walls between us. It convinces us that we need to hide who we really are, to, to play outside ourselves, to play the role of good, pious Christian in front of each other and not share what's really going on. Richard Foster says something very similar to this. He says that we don't like to confess our sin because we've convinced ourselves that everyone else around us is some kind of holy Christian, that everyone else is a saint and we're the only real sinner. So we don't say anything about our sin, which of course makes other people think that we must be perfect, so they don't say anything either. Therefore, he says, we hide ourselves from one another and live in veiled lies and hypocrisy. But when we actually open up and confess our sins, not just to God, but to another Christian as well, then we experience not only healing, but we also make it possible for others to do the same. Uh, later in this chapter, Foster talks about a time in his own life when he decided to, to take time over the course of three days to reflect back on the whole of his life and write down any sins that he could remember. And then he took what he'd written to a trusted Christian friend and counselor, and he made a confession. And you know what happened? Not only did he experience profound personal healing as a result, he also made it possible for his friend to do the same. The exposure of my humanity, he says, evidently sparked a freedom in my friend. For directly following his prayer for me, he was able to express a deep and troubling sin that he had been unable to confess until then. Freedom begets freedom. So that's why you should confess your sins not only because it will bring healing and freedom to your own soul, but also because it will make real relationships, real community possible. But what about the question of how? How should you confess your sins? It's easy enough to say that you should confess your sins, but what does that mean? What does it entail? What does a confession involve? And who are you supposed to make it to? Again, Foster has a lot to say. Now, first, he, he borrows from an 18th century Catholic bishop, Alphonsus of Liguori. And using Alphonsus, he identifies three distinct parts to a confession of sin, which include an examination of conscience, sorrow over the sin, and a determination to avoid sin in the future. Now, let's take each of these three in turn. First, in order to confess sin, we need to examine our conscience, which is a practice that has, let's be honest, it's become increasingly rare today. Today, it seems most people, Christians included, assume that we just intrinsically know what is right and what is wrong. And then if you've done anything wrong, you'll know because you'll feel bad about it. But that was not the assumption of Christians in the past. They didn't assume that their conscience would always inform them. Instead, they examined themselves according to some kind of objective, godly standard. Martin Luther, for instance, Luther would regularly and methodically go through each of the Ten Commandments in prayer as a way of examining his conscience. And Foster mentions that, and along with other suggested practices like like using the seven deadly sins, pride, greed, anger, sloth, gluttony, so forth, using those as a standard for examining yourself. And the point is, before you confess, you need to spend, intentionally spend time allowing the Holy Spirit to help you identify sin. The second confession of sin should include sorrow over sin. In 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10, St. Paul talks about godly sorrow, godly sorrow that he says leads to repentance and to salvation. Likewise, Psalm 51 says that the sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken and contrite spirit. 
Uh, we might wish to avoid it, but sorrow and contrition are an essential aspect of confession. Finally, Foster says that confession includes a determination to avoid sin. It's not enough just to confess your sin. You need to desire to overcome it. We must desire, he says, to be conquered and ruled by God. Or if we do not desire it, to desire to desire it. These are all three essential elements of confession. But what about the question of who we should use as a confessor? To whom should we go to confess our sins? Uh, Richard Foster says that since every Christian shares in the priesthood of Christ, any Christian could serve as a potential confessor. And he's right. The Bible doesn't say that you have to confess your sins only to a member of the clergy. But there are Christian traditions, including the Anglican tradition, to which I belong, that have long recommended the practice of confessing your sin to a priest or pastor. And the reason for that is rather simple. First, priests and pastors are those who have been set apart through a process and service of ordination, set apart to serve as leaders and representatives of the church. And a part of their role is to pronounce God's word of forgiveness. Second, priests are those who have been trained to listen to confessions with, with proper confident confidentiality and to give any counsel that might be needed. That doesn't mean that no other Christian can or should hear you confess your sins, or that every priest is going to be a great person to serve as a confessor. But it does mean that if you have the option, you would be wise to seek someone who has been trained and entrusted with doing just that. In fact, although Richard Foster, as a Quaker, doesn't belong to a tradition that has clergy, he does actually give several reasons why seeking out this sort of formal rite of confession is often very helpful. Although, I'm sure he would say that what is most important is not who you confess your sins to, but simply that you do it. What did James say? Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Friends, let us do as James tells us. Don't hide your sins away in secret. Confess them. Confess them for the good of your own soul and confess them for the good of others as well. Mm -hmm.